than uh, in, in this music industry. You had mentioned how after uh, Off the Wall and, uh, and Thriller, it just started to go down. I remember one of my feelings was, uh, you know, black artists who uh, start out singing with musicians, when they make that shift to working with uh, beat machine producers, I, I almost never like it. Uh, it it's, um, it's always difficult for me to digest. And you wonder, like, why, why, why did that happen? And you use the word enabler. So these record labels, uh, A&R, advisors, people, close people who know better, people who know how to work it to, to get the, uh, the maximum appeal so they can sell to the maximum amount of people, probably in his ear, OK, you need to work with this one now. You need to work with that one now so that you can uh, so that the, the, the young people can relate, you know. So here we, here we go with uh, Teddy Riley and uh, say the Dangerous album, or or uh, working with uh, just young beat machine producers, and mm -hmm. and that to me, you know, a singer a singer that sings with musicians, that sings to a track, that sings to electronic music, essentially. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I feel like it's either or. You, you sing with musicians, or you sing, uh, you know, or you start out with beat machines, and you just go that way, and maybe you perform live with musicians. So I think a lot of those decisions were about how to how to promote, how to sell, how to keep them relevant. And uh, I think he listened, and I think he uh, went along. I think he he held on. He had his opinion, and he had his his way, and then he wrote the songs, and things ended up being his way. But I think he took all those things into consideration. So that there's you know people who become national and international phenoms are going to have people around them that always know what's best or what's better for them, and uh, I think anybody, I mean, not just Michael, is going to uh, going to listen. And uh, when when the the hype or or, or the, the bottom line is to be the best or sell the most, yeah, you you're going to uh, probably do some things that you you might not have might not have done otherwise so anybody else want to respond to that? i mean i want to respond to that but i also want to respond to this just i mean I, you know i i just in the course of working on that documentary i read so much about michael jackson i think one of the most difficult things for us to imagine that's true about michael jackson is the whole idea that michael jackson didn't do shit he didn't want to do i think that in itself is that's so little precedent for that i don't actually think in fact the whole idea that he made, made decisions based on what somebody else told Michael Jackson to do. Michael Jackson, people told Michael Jackson to stop having little kids come to sleepovers. And Michael Jackson was like, fuck y'all, I'm gonna do what I wanna do. I'm Michael Jackson. Do you know who I am? How much money and power I have? I'm gonna do exactly what I wanna do. Quincy Jones couldn't tell Michael Jackson what to do. Nobody could tell Michael Jackson what to do. I mean, that's the monstrous and profound part of who he was. Like, uh, and, and this is it. My favorite single moment in this is it is when they're showing the 3D thing that they were working on with all the dancers and all that kind of stuff. And Michael Jackson's sitting there with a lollipop in his mouth. Mm -hmm. And he's going like, mm -hmm. part, I don't want that part. To me, because I was like, wow, this is like, there's so little rep few representations of a black person, black man in this instance, with that level of self-determinacy on display. Just completely doing what he wants to do, Nobody's telling him what to do. So I'm just saying, to that degree, I was kind of disagree with that part a little bit, like him working with beat machines. I think he got older. Mm. <laughs> you know, as I said, his, reach, his access to what was happening in the streets became more and more distanced. Mm. And so as a consequence, he just had to bring people and he had to hire people. So Teddy Riley was hot. Tim Roddy Jerkins was hot. You know what I'm saying? It was, it was kind of very different from like where he comes out of that Motown machine with a whole bunch of stuff surrounding him, forming him, and he makes choices. That make, but like, <clears throat> nobody wanted Michael Jackson to work with Quincy Jones. Mm -hmm. The record company said no, everybody said no, because they were like, he's too jazzy. It was like, he's too jazzy, it's never gonna be a hit. And he was like, no, nah, this is who I want, right? Uh, one of the Mazel brothers who wrote Mike, the Jackson Five's first song told this really funny story about Michael Jackson. He said his 
because these guys all went to Howard University, HU. Um, <laughs> he, they all went to Howard University, and one of their classmates was the head record guy under the head of uh, under Yanikoff, right? And so in the beginning, they were going to take uh, beat it off the off the um, yeah, I off that Thriller, story. right? And he said Michael Jackson went there and said you can't do this, and it was like, well, Michael, the decision's kind of been made. And he said, man, Michael Jackson broke down and started crying, mm -hmm. having a complete sob fest. And the guy said he was so unnerved by the whole thing <laughs> that he, he said, okay, Michael, cool, whatever. We're going to just do it the way that you want to do it. And he said, Michael, just stop crying on a dime. <laughs> and stood up and walked out. Lene, you know? we want to we get um, folks in. I'm going to get as many questions. Because as just context.